Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out um, today to listen to um, a little bit about my research. But also, what I really wanted to talk about today is just immunotherapy in general. So we hear a lot about immunotherapy in the news, um, on TV, the newspapers, things like that. Um, but the actual mechanisms behind it can be quite difficult to understand when you just hear um, a lot about it all the time. Um, and this is something that I'm really excited about. So my PhD project really focused on um, immunotherapy. And so I'm very passionate about trying to communicate um, this research to a, a wider audience. Um, as Katia mentioned, um, I completed my PhD at the beginning of the year with Associate Professor Nicholas Huntington. Um, and I've now um, been a postdoctoral fellow in his lab since July. So <clears throat> today, what I'm going to talk to you about um, is a few things. So I want to give you a little bit of a background um, on cancer treatments and talk about how we kind of got to this stage of immunotherapy. And then I want to tell you a little bit about my own research, my own PhD project, and I guess where we think immunotherapy is going in the near future. So I'll just start <clears throat> with a little bit about cancer and some statistics. So in Australia in 2017, one in two people were diagnosed with cancer, will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And of these people that are diagnosed with cancer, one in five are going to die from this illness in their lifetime. In Australia in 2018, so right now, 138,321 new cancer diagnoses will be made this year. And so when we think about this, even though we've come so far in cancer treatment, these statistics really just aren't good enough. And so there's this unmet need to really continually improve current treatment options. So I want to take you back um, very far now into the past um, and talk about some really early forms of cancer treatment. So a lot of us here today might think about cancer as being a, a relatively new disease burden, but actually the earliest description of cancer dates back as far as 3000 BC and was found in Egyptian mummies. And even back then, they realised that cancer was something that they needed to get rid of um, and that this was a really devastating disease. And they used um, a lot of different ancient treatments, so things like surgery, uh, cauterisation or burning tumours, different herbal remedies, trying to use fruit juices and tea leaves and things like that. And you know, really horrible paste made from things like arsenic, sulfur, or mercury. And obviously with their limited knowledge on how to treat cancer, there was really little chance of cure with all these types of treatments that they were trying to <clears throat> establish. So if we jump to modern cancer treatment, this is really can be defined or has been defined over the last 20 to 30 years by four pillars of cancer treatment. These include radiotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and targeted therapy. And I just want to tell you a little bit about each one um, over the next few slides. So the first pillar of cancer treatment is radiotherapy. Now, radiotherapy uses the element radium, which was discovered by Marie Curie in 1898. And what radiotherapy is used for is to shrink inoperable tumours um, to make them easier to remove before surgery. However, radiation really isn't uh, limited to the tumour area and can damage surrounding healthy tissue. And this can lead to long-term side effects such as infertility. And also because the radiation can damage these healthy tissues, this can also lead to the development of secondary cancers over time. And unfortunately, while radiation might be really good for um, tumours that are localised to a primary site, it really has limited effectiveness against cancers that have metastasized to other organs. So the second pillar of cancer treatment is surgery. And we know that surgery is still really well utilized today in the clinic. Um, and surgery is really good uh, at relieving um, pain or symptoms that are associated with cancer. So for example, if you have a tumor that's pressing on a particular organ that's causing a lot of discomfort, um, surgery can really alleviate these um, symptoms. 
And because surgery removes the uh, entire cancer cell or the entire tumour, there's no chance of resistance of these cancer cells because once they're removed from your body, they're removed. However, surgery can be quite invasive and Again, similar to radiotherapy, it can't always completely eliminate tumour cells, especially if they've metastasized to other organs. And so surgery is usually its most effective when it's combined with other forms of treatment like radiotherapy or chemotherapy in order to be curative. And again, similar to radiotherapy, um, there are also um, painful side effects that come from surgery, such as the surgery itself, um, but also um, these inevitable risks that are associated with anaesthesia. So the third pillar of um, cancer treatment is something that I'm sure that we're all well aware of, which is chemotherapy. And it really has been one of the gold standards of cancer treatments, especially in the last, I guess, 20 to 30 years. And unlike radiotherapy, chemotherapy can also eliminate, eliminate metastasized cells. So it's not just localised to a primary tumour site. And so it can be really helpful in um, shrinking tumours prior to surgery or radiation treatments. However, one of the biggest caveats with chemotherapy is that chemotherapy doesn't discriminate against healthy tissues and also your diseased or tumour cells. And unfortunately, the treatment can take hours, days, weeks or several months. And as I mentioned before, because it doesn't discriminate against your diseased and normal tissues, this really can compromise your immune system, which is there to help keep you safe. Um, and again, with as well as um, surgery and radiotherapy, chemotherapy comes with its own list of side effects such as hair loss, nausea, mouth sores and bruises and also uh, long-term infertility. So the fourth pillar of cancer treatment is what is known as targeted therapy. And this has been really uh, largely successful um, in the past few years. And so targeted therapies are designed, uh, they're drugs that are designed to block the growth of a cancer by interfering with a specific molecular target that is only present on a tumour cell. So unlike chemotherapy, which can't discriminate between healthy cells and disease cells, these targeted therapies are very discriminatory. And a really um, good example of one of these targeted therapies is the drug venetoclax, which was de developed here at Weihai. And so venetoclax targets this protein BCL2, and BCL2 is really overexpressed in particular tumours. So when you target this protein, you're being a little bit more specific um, in your targeting of um, disease cells versus healthy cells. And targeted therapy has really set this cornerstone or the benchmark of precision medicine, which is using information about a person or a patient, so their genes, the proteins that are expressed on their specific tumour cells, and using this information to really tailor the type of cancer treatment that they get. And this results in less severe side effects than radiotherapy or chemotherapy. But unfortunately, um, a lot of these treatments while they're initially um, really successful, cancer cells can sometimes outsmart these therapies and can become resistant to targeted therapy. So that brings me to the fifth pillar of cancer treatment and my favourite pillar of cancer treatment, um, and that is known as immunotherapy. So what is immunotherapy? Well, immunotherapy is described as a biological therapy that stimulates your body's own immune system, your own immune response, to have an anti-tumor function. <clears throat> now, while you might think that um, the role of the immune system in an anti-cancer response is relatively new, the idea that the immune system can play a role in eradicating tumors has actually been around for more than 100 years. And it was first mentioned in the early uh, 1890s when William Coley showed that when, if he injected bacteria into some of his cancer patients, he could mount an immune response and a, a portion of the patient's cancers regressed. However, it wasn't really f um, until more recently that this idea of utilising the immune system in the fight against cancer was really um, utilised. And that brings me to where we are now, which is what scientists and clinicians are calling a cancer immunotherapy revolution. So immunotherapy has been hailed as one of the biggest breakthroughs in cancer treatment in a generation and one of the most important medical advances of our time. 
And this is just showing a couple of different um, high impact journals that are, are headlining this cancer immunotherapy um, revolution. And so it really shows that it has been brought to the forefront, especially in our research um, over the last five to 10 years. So how can we target the immune system to enhance immunotherapy or to create immunotherapies? And here I've just shown you a basic schematic of our immune system, which can be broken up into two arms. You have your innate immune system or your rapid immune system and your adaptive immune system or your more long-term, um, slower immune system. And both of these arms are made up of a, a number of different immune cells, each of which has the potential to be targeted for immunotherapy. So I'm gonna go through a couple of types of immunotherapies that are currently being um, used in the clinic or in clinical trials. And the first one I wanna briefly talk about is cancer vaccines. So what cancer vaccines look at doing is isolating this particular immune cell, so a dendritic cell, and what they do is they load these dendritic cells with um, parts of the tumour, grow them up, inject them back into the patient so that then they can present these tumour antigens or these tumour proteins to your immune system and mount a response against this tumour, hopefully resulting in eradication of the tumour or decrease in tumour burden. Another type of immunotherapy that has seen um, large success is known as T-cell therapy. So again, another different immune cell um, that's being targeted here is the T-cell. Now in this particular type of therapy, T-cells are isolated from patients. They're then genetically modified to express a receptor that recognizes a protein specific to the tumor cell. These T-cells are, are then expanded outside of the body and infused back into the patient where they can now go directly to the tumour that they now recognise from this receptor um, and again, hopefully eradicate the tumour and decrease tumour burden. However, they are just a couple of immunotherapies that I wanted to touch on, but the main focus of today's talk and what I really want to spend the most time looking at is this particular type of immunotherapy called checkpoint inhibitors. And checkpoint inhibitors are among one of the most promising approaches to activating the therapeutic anti-tumor immunity. And it's by blocking these immune checkpoints. So what are immune checkpoints? Immune, when we have an immune response to something like the flu or a pathogen, um, our body creates an immune response to clear this pathogen or clear the flu, clear the bacteria. However, once that pathogen is cleared, what needs to happen is that the immune system needs to be regulated and dampened so that we don't cause these out of control immune responses. And that's where immune checkpoints come in. So they're really designed to keep our immune system at bay so once it's done its job, we can return our bodies back to normal and go on um, living our healthy lives. It's when you don't have these checkpoints or that they're not working properly that you mount uncontrolled immune responses to pathogens. And this can cause things like autoimmune diseases um, that we hear a lot about. So these immune checkpoints are really important for keeping, maintaining our homeostasis and our health. Unfortunately, in the context of cancer, what tumours can do is that they can utilise these immune checkpoint pathways and they use this as a mechanism of immune resistance. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about one particular checkpoint that has been very successful in the clinic. Um, and this is the checkpoint inhibitor anti-PD-1. So PD-1 is a receptor expressed on T cells, again, one of these immune cells. And Ligation of this particular receptor <clears throat> um, limits the response, the immune response, in order to protect us, again, from these autoimmune diseases. However, in the context of cancer, we have here a CD8 T cell recognising a protein expressed by the tumour, sending a signal to the CD8 T cell that this is a tumour that they need to kill, a cell that they need to kill. However, what the tumour can do is that it can upregulate this PD-1 ligand, so PDL1, this binds to PD-1 on the CD8 T cell and sends a message to the CD8 T cell to limit its response and stop killing the tumor cell. This then results in the outgrowth of the tumor cell and eventually metastases. 
So what do these checkpoint inhibitors actually do? They're, so they're, what they're known as doing is releasing the brakes on, this, um, Im, on the immune system. So again, we have this situation where the CD8 T cell is recognizing the tumor cell. It, goes, um, it sends a signal to the CD8 T cell to kill the tumor. Now we come in with this anti-PD-1 antibody. So this is now bound to the PD-1 receptor on the CD8 T cell. So now when the tumor cell tries to upregulate pd one and block this, in, and block this um, CD8 T cell function, this interaction is now blocked by the pd one antibody. And this allows the T cell to continually do its job and eventually eradicate the tumor cell. And these particular checkpoint inhibitors, so anti pd one but also another type of T-cell checkpoint inhibitor that works relatively similarly, which is anti-CTLA-4, have shown really immense promise in the clinic. And these are just um, three different graphs taken from three different clinical trials, three different journals. And it's just showing you here that the, the use of these anti pd one checkpoint inhibitors, either alone or as a combination therapy with the anti-CTLA-4, show um, really great improvement in increased overall survival, but also progression-free survival when you look at it compared to standard therapies um, such as chemotherapy or surgery. And this is more just, um, again, looking at the same inhibitors, but just showing the decrease in tumor growth when um, these some patients are treated with these checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see here that this is a tumor mass and after treatment, um, these once uh, incurable or inoperable tumors are now able um, to be shrunk with the administration of these checkpoint inhibitors. However, as I feel like I keep mentioning, um, current checkpoint inhibit inhibitors, like um, other cancer treatments, still have their limitations. And a couple of limitations that um, you might hear about are uh, primary resistance and acquired resistance. And I just want to explain these a little bit um, in a bit more detail. So for primary resistance, if this is the tumor mass here, you have both tumor cells that are resistant to checkpoint inhibitors, which are in red, and also tumor cells susceptible to checkpoint inhibitors that are in purple. So when you go in and treat with the che checkpoint inhibitor, while the um, susceptible cells are uh, removed and cleared, these, um, the non-susceptible cells or these resistant cells remain and the tumour may not shrink very much. These resistant cells then continue to divide and the tumour regrows um, following treatment. We then have this alternate scenario which is acquired resistance. So here we have a tumour made up of cells that are all susceptible to these checkpoint inhibitors. So we go in with the treatment and most of the cells die and the tumors shrink significantly. However, what can happen is that one or two of these remaining um, tumor cells, whilst very small, can acquire resistance to the checkpoint inhibitor. So eventually these resistant cells form new tumors that can no longer respond to this checkpoint inhibitor. As well as primary and acquired resistance, Current checkpoint in, uh, inhibitors also have some limitations in the severe side effects that, that can result from this treatment. Um, because, as I mentioned, using checkpoint inhibitors is really taking the brakes off your immune response, some of these side effects um, evolve, result in immune-related adverse events. And while they can be quite mild, so things like gastrointestinal discomfort, some of the side effects can be quite severe, um, there can be autoimmune neuropathy, severe um, gastritis, and also um, severe dermatitis of the skin as well. And so again, although we have seen success with these um, current checkpoint inhibitors, there is still this need to target novel pathways and different or new immune cells to try and improve on and add to current immunotherapies. So again, I just want to show you this picture of um, this little schematic of the immune system. And the two checkpoint inhibitors that I've talked about mainly, so anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, really focus on these T cells that are part of the adaptive immune system. But of course, as you can see, there are a whole host of other cells that still have the potential to be targeted for immunotherapy. And one other cell that um, we are looking at in our laboratory are natural killer cells 
or NK cells. So NK cells are derived from the bone marrow and they're really dependent on this growth factor called interleukin-15 or R15. In humans, they represent about 5 to 20% of our mononuclear cells in the blood, spleen and liver. And NK cells really act as sentinels, constantly travelling around the body, looking for altered, stressed or mutated cells and eradicating these before they cause any large tumour burden or sickness. And this is just a really short video that I wanted to show, but I don't know if it's going to work. Um, so this um, video is co courtesy of Nigel Waterhouse, and I just want you to pay attention. So where these round um, circles are, so these elongated um, cells here, they're tumour cells, and these round ones, these are NK cells. And so you can see that as the NK cells are making contact with these tumour cells, they're just um, rupturing and blebbing. And so just really highlighting their, um, this innate anti-tumour function that these NK cells already possess. So as well as their inherent um, anti-tumour function, we know that NK cell infiltration in tumours can predict cancer outcomes in humans. So what we've looked at here is three types of metastases from melanoma patients, breast cancer patients and lung cancer patients. And what we find is that if these metastases have a high infiltration of natural killer cells, which is the orange line, their overall survival is improved. So really identifying to us how important NK cells are in these metastases at helping to reduce tumour burden. In, so that was in some solid um, tumour models, but in AML we also see that when we look at the fitness of an NK cell, so whether they are really healthy and functional or a little bit defective, we can see that the chance of relapse of AML is significantly, significantly reduced when we have really healthy, active NK cells. Now, we're not the only lab or the only group to um, really... I guess, want to focus on NK cells as an immunotherapy, they're really good targets for this anti-tumor function. And so there are already a couple of um, NK cell immunotherapies that are currently being trialed. And so I just want to go through a couple of them with you now. So um, this particular treatment is um, taking NK cells from a patient. So you're taking whole blood, um, isolating your NK cells, growing them up and expanding them, and then again, um, injecting them or infusing them back into the patient to go in and, and really ramp up the number of NK cells in the human body. However, this therapy is really limited because NK cells have such a short half-life. So you really need to infuse um, large, large numbers to get any type of response um, from the patient. There are also other therapies um, looking at trying to enhance the NK cell function. So as I mentioned before, NK cells are uh, really dependent on this growth factor R15. So there have been some therapies looking at just injecting these cytokines directly into patients, but these have had uh, a lot of um, off-target and severe side effects. Um, another NK cell immunotherapy that uh, was looking really promising was targeting inhibitory receptors on NK cells. Now, I said to you before that NK cells, they're constantly circulating around the body and looking for cells that might be stressed or transformed or infected. And the way they do this is with um, is through both activating and inhibitory receptors that are expressed on their cell surface. So, for example, if a tumour cell is expressing an activating ligand and this interacts with an NK cell activating receptor, this sends a signal to the NK cell to kill the tumour cell. However, tumour cells can also upregulate, upregulate these inhibitory um, ligands and when they bind to NK cell inhibitory receptors, this sends a message to the NK cell not to kill. And so one of these... Um, promising immunotherapies really looked at blocking, using antibodies to block this interaction, similar to what we see with the checkpoint inhibitors. However, really, um, unfortunately, these uh, clinical trials were really largely unsuccessful. And I think that this really highlighted to us that although there's a lot of interest in targeting NK cells, we're really yet to effectively do this. 
And a reason why um, this seems to be the case is that there's this real unmet need for a deeper understanding of NK cell biology. And that's where my PhD project and our lab um, our lab's work comes in. So we wanted to know how we can really target NK cells. So we know that, as I mentioned multiple times, that the growth factor R15 is really essential for all aspects of NK cell biology, for their survival, for their differentiation, and also for their anti-tumor function. We know that R15 is really important in the context of a tumor as well, because when we look at melanoma metastases, if we find uh, melanoma metastases that have really high levels of R15, these patients have uh, significantly improved overall survival compared to those patients that have low R15 expressed um, in the tumour. And this suggests that there is more of an infiltration of NK cells as well. So you'd be thinking, well, why don't we just inject R15 into the patients or into the tumour so that we can um, improve or increase the numbers of NK cells? But unfortunately, R15 has a really short half-life and you need really high doses to try and see any kind of functional response. And again, injecting these into a patient can be really quite toxic. So we had to find a way around this. And a way that we thought that we could do this was, well, what if we could understand how this R15 um, was signaling and be able to target this within the NK cell? And a major finding that came out of our lab over the um, last couple of years is that the major regulator of R15 signaling in NK cells is this protein known as cis. So how does this cis work? Well, when R15 binds the R15 receptor that is expressed on NK cells, this sends um, a message to the NK cell to start the production of different genes that are important for things like proliferation, function, and survival. One of these genes is the gene CISH. So CISH, a little bit confusingly, makes a protein called CIS. <laughs> and then CIS acts as a checkpoint to suppress NK cell growth and function and is really one of these NK cell checkpoints, so keeping the NK cell response in place. So once cis binds back to this receptor, you now have shut down um, all the genes important for proliferation, for tumor killing, for survival. And this is really there to keep us safe so that our natural killer cells don't proliferate or grow out of control. Well, so we thought, what would happen if we blocked cis? So now, again, you have this um, R15 binding the receptor of the NK cell. You're sending this message to um, start the production of different genes important for NK cell biology. But now we're blocking this particular, um, this particular gene called CISH. So now what happens is we don't have this negative regulation anymore. We've blocked this checkpoint. And now R15 can continue to signal through the NK cell and all of these really important anti-tumor functions like proliferation and um, anti-tumor killing function are now all improved and increased. So what does this look like experimentally? Well, we find that if we block cis in an experimental model of melanoma, we find that the blocking of cis significantly reduces the tumor burden. And you can see here that, so when cis is present, we get uh, overrun with metastases, but when you block cis, you really, um, you really lose majority of this tumor burden. Similarly, in AML, we find that when we block cis, now we have a really significant increased overall survival in response to AML, as opposed to when cis is present and suppressing the NK cell response. And this has really been where um, <clears throat> my uh, project has um, taken off and um, the results coming from my PhD, which has now really excitingly had both clinical and translational potential. So what we feel is that the therapeutic inhibition of cis in patients or maybe in NK cells that have been expanded from a patient can really improve the prognosis of a whole host of different cancers. And as Katia mentioned before, this really exciting research is now um, being able to be propelled further because we've been able to partner with a drug company who's interested in developing small molecule inhibitors against this cis and hopefully take us into more preclinical models. 
So in summary, I hope you have a little bit of a better understanding of what immunotherapy is um, and where we are with immunotherapy at the moment and also in the research world. So immunotherapy uses the body's own immune system to fight cancer. Um, as I've shown you, there are multiple ways that we can target the immune system and a whole host of different immune cells that can be utilised in this way. The current checkpoint inhibitors um, using T cells are among the most promising approaches to activating therapeutic anti-tumor immunity. So there's checkpoint inhibitors like anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. However, to really improve current checkpoint inhibitors and move immunotherapy forward, it really relies on the investigation of other immune cells. So as I mentioned, natural killer cells is one ideal candidate. And to be able to utilise these other cells really can help design a more rational drug combinations. So as I mentioned before, some problems we encounter like primary and acquired resistance, this might be able to be overcome if we know a good way to rationally design a drug combination. For example, if you're treating with anti pd one and then some tumour cells acquire resistance, you might then be able to go in with another treatment that targets NK cells, for example, and now those um, initially resistant resistant cells are now susceptible to this alternate form of immunotherapy. And lastly, I just want to leave you with this slide. So um, you're not meant to be able to read it, so don't squint too hard. <laughs> um, but this is just taken from a couple of um, recent journals, and it's just highlighting the number of different immunotherapies, and mainly uh, all of these are checkpoint inhibitors, focusing um, on a number of different cancer types. And this is just showing all the different clinical trials that are currently either underway or just finished their phase one um, clinical reports. So I guess what I want you to take away from this is that although we have come so far with cancer treatment and we're in such an exciting time for this type of um, cancer immunotherapy, there's still so much more um, left to be explored. And today I've only shown you a really small part of how we're trying to help um, this particular area of research and how we want to bring it forward. But we're only one group in, in one institute and if you imagine that there are probably thousands and thousands of us around the world that are all striving towards um, the same goal, which is to just really try and eradicate cancer in the end. I think that this really is just a nice thing to end on to, to really highlight that things are happening and, and the cancer game is changing. So we're in a really exciting time. Um, and with that, I'd just really like to go through some acknowledgements really quickly. So I mentioned to you before um, my laboratory head and supervisor, Associate Professor Nicholas Huntington, um, has been a huge part of all this work. Um, I've been in his lab since 2013. Um, my whole lab, I don't know where this thing is, oh there. Um, my whole lab, that it's when you are a researcher and you're very passionate about your job, you, I'm sure you can imagine that you work a lot. And so it's really nice to be able to get along really well with um, the people that you work with. There's such a supportive group of scientists and it's really nice to come to work every day <clears throat> and feel, um, feel that we're all working towards the same goal. Um, my PhD committee and supervisors um, were really important and integral to all this work. And of course, I couldn't um, do all this work without my mentors, um, whether they're scientific or just um, uh, helpful for, for other as aspects of um, my research career. But lastly, who I really need to thank um, are the foundations and the charities that allow me to do the research that I love to do because um, I wouldn't be able to do this research without them. So I need to thank the Leukaemia Foundation because they funded my PhD scholarship um, and Cancer Therapeutics also uh, helped with my PhD scholarship. The Peaky Brothers Foundation um, helped me to go overseas, uh, learn some new techniques, meet other labs that are also studying NK cell immunotherapy and really broaden my understanding. And uh, since July this year, I've been a Cancer Council Victoria postdoctoral fellow, so um, I need to thank them as well.